We've discussed how a dynamic equilibrium can be described by an equilibrium constant, how a state away from equilibrium can be described by a reaction quotient, and how comparing the two can tell you which direction the reaction will go to establish equilibrium. It's now time to look at how we can determine exactly how far the reaction will go, and what the resulting set of concentrations will be. The most convenient way to do this is using what is known as an ice table. Here's the idea with an example. Here we have acetic acid, the acid in vinegar, reacting with water, the solvent, to give the water an H+, resulting in the acetate ion and the hydronium ion. This hydronium ion is characteristic of aqueous acids, so we will be seeing a lot more of it this semester. Because this is an acid, doing its main acid reaction of giving up an H+, the equilibrium constant has a special designation, Ka, where the A stands for acid. Don't worry about remembering that right now. We'll come back to it later in a lesson on acids and bases. This particular reaction has an equilibrium constant at room temperature of 1.7 times 10 to the negative fifth molar. We'll set up the problem so that we are making a 0.2 molar acetic acid solution, and we want to know what the hydronium ion concentration will be. Our ice table has three rows set up under the reaction, initial, change, and equilibrium whose initials spell ice. We have a column for each species whose concentration matters to the equilibrium constant. Remember that water, as the solvent, doesn't factor into the equilibrium constant. So now we fill in our initial conditions. We are told we are starting with 0.2 molar acetic acid. I'm just putting the number here, but I like to include the units in the corner as a reminder that all of our entries in the table will be in molarity. Next, we enter our initial concentrations of the acetate ion and the hydronium ion, which we will assume to be zero, since we weren't told otherwise in the problem statement. Now we need to think about the change line. Clearly, if we are starting with concentrations of zero for the products, the only direction the reaction can go is to the right. How much will it go to the right? We don't know yet, so we'll call it x. Now for every acetate ion created, due to the stoichiometry of the reaction, we get one hydronium ion. So the change in hydronium ion concentration will also be x. And for every acetate ion created, again due to the stoichiometry of the reaction, one acetic acid molecule will be consumed. So that change will be negative x. And now we add the initial and change lines to get the equilibrium line. And we have completed our ice table. The next thing to do is to plug in the equilibrium concentrations we just determined into our equilibrium constant expression, and then solve for x. An application of the quadratic formula, and you find two possible solutions. The second one doesn't make physical sense because it implies negative concentrations, so the first answer has to be correct. And so we now know that the concentration of hydronium ion is 0.00187 molar. Let's look at another example. Here we're going to look at the dissolution of an ionic compound. Let's say magnesium fluoride. Once again, we leave out the substance where the concentration isn't meaningful, the solid. This type of equilibrium constant also has a special name, the solubility product. So we label the equilibrium constant with a subscripted SP to indicate that. Notice in this expression that the fluoride ion concentration is squared due to the reaction stoichiometry. Also notice the units on the equilibrium constant. Different equilibrium constants will have different units based on the stoichiometry of the reaction. We're going to see how much magnesium fluoride can dissolve, so we start with zero of each of the ions. For the change, notice that for each formula unit of magnesium fluoride that dissolves, you get two units of the fluoride ion, so that entry is 2x. Again, the equilibrium line is just the sum of the first two. We plug it into the equilibrium expression and solve. This one is easier because we don't need the quadratic formula. So we find that in a saturated solution of magnesium fluoride, the concentration of magnesium ions is 0.0021 molar, and the concentration of fluoride ions is twice that. Let's now look at a related problem. There's another compound of magnesium, magnesium phosphate, that has a much lower solubility product. Let's suppose we start with our saturated solution of magnesium fluoride, and then add some lithium phosphate, which has a high solubility. At saturation, lithium phosphate has a phosphate ion concentration of 0.0544 molar. So what happens? We now have four different ions floating around. 
magnesium, lithium, fluoride, and phosphate. But the combination with the lowest solubility is magnesium phosphate. So let's look at that equilibrium. We know this reaction is going to shift to the left, so we want our change line to be negative. Make sure you're clear on the coefficients. And now we plug into the equilibrium constant expression. That's a pretty nasty polynomial equation with powers that go up to x to the fifth, but we can plug it in easily to something like Wolfram alpha and get our answers quickly. Of the five roots of this equation, the imaginary ones aren't physical, and the last two are too big. They would result in negative concentrations. So the first one has to be the correct answer. And plugging the result in, we get our answer. Nearly all of the magnesium will pre precipitate out, as expected. It is also possible in these kinds of problems to use experimental data to calculate the equilibrium constant. Suppose we make a solution of lactic acid at a concentration of 0.2 molar. We complete our table. As we will learn in an upcoming lesson, the concentration of the hydronium ion is extremely easy to measure, and in this experiment we measure it to be 0.0125 molar. That one measurement lets us determine the other concentrations, and plugging the results into the equilibrium constant lets us calculate that equilibrium constant. Sometimes you can make your calculations easier by making some careful approximations. For example, let's look at the complex ion formation between copper 2 and ammonia. We start with a solution that is 1 molar in ammonia and add enough copper 2 to make it 0.01 molar in that ion. And we want to know the final concentrations. But when we try to do this calculation, we run into two problems. First, we end up with a fifth order polynomial, and so we would have to resort to Wolfram alpha or something similar to find the solutions. Second, the result is a number that is nearly indistinguishable from the, our concentration of copper that we started with, and we would have to go out to a ridiculous number of digits to even see the difference. So instead, let's try an alternate approach. The first thing to notice is how huge this equilibrium constant is. And thinking about the way an equilibrium constant is structured, with the products in the numerator and the reactants in the denominator, a huge equilibrium constant means that the reaction is going to be product favored. So let's start our calculation by assuming that the reaction has essentially gone to completion. That will slightly overestimate the extent of reaction, but only slightly. Now let's use this shifted set of concentrations as our new starting point. Fill out the table and stop and think again. We strongly suspect that X is going to be tiny because our new starting point is very close to equilibrium. So that suggests that 4X is going to be tiny compared to 0.96, so we'll neglect it. X might even be tiny compared to 0.01, so we'll neglect that too. Don't worry, we'll check those assumptions in a moment to verify that they're reasonable. So notice how simple our equilibrium expression has now become. You can do this calculation on a normal scientific calculator, and when we get the answer, we see that our assumptions that we could neglect 4x and x are easily validated. In general, when you have a large equilibrium constant, shift your equilibrium conditions as far towards the products as possible. If you have a tiny equilibrium constant, shift your initial conditions as far towards reactants as possible. Make the assumption that you are close to equilibrium, and thus x will be small, and do the easy calculation. Then check your assumptions to make sure they were valid. If they weren't, then do the more complicated calculation. And that's the basics of equilibrium calculations using ice tables. The next several lessons will be extensive applications of equilibrium calculations in a variety of different contexts. So spend some time making sure that you're comfortable with the concepts we've talked about here. As long as you approach these kinds of problems systematically, you'll find that these calculations aren't too complicated.